Chapter 13. There's time to spare. This is one of the things I wasn't prepared for. The amount of unfilled time. The long parentheses of nothing. Time as white sound. If only I could embroider, weave, knit, or something to do with my hand. I want a cigarette. I remember walking in art galleries through the 19th century. The obsession they had with them, with then with harems. Dozens of paintings of harems, fat women lolling on divans, turbans on their heads or velvet caps, being fanned with peacock tails, a eunuch in the background, standing guard. Studies of sedentary flesh painted by men who'd never been there. These pictures were supposed to be erotic, and I thought they were at the time, but I see now what they were really about. They were paintings about suspended animation, about waiting, about objects not in use. They were paintings about boredom, but maybe boredom is erotic when women do it for men. I wait, washed, brushed, fed like a prized pig. Sometime in the 80s, they invented pig balls for pigs who are being fattened in pens. Pig balls were large colored balls, the pigs that rolled them around in their, with their snouts. The pig marketers said this improved their muscle tone. The pigs were curious. They liked to have something to think about. I read about that in Introduction to Psychology, that and the chapter on caged rats who'd give themselves electric shocks for something to do, and the one on the pigeons trained to peck a button that made a grain of corn appear. Three groups of them. The first one, the, the first got one grain per peck. The second, one grain every other peck. The third was random. When the man in charge cut off the grain, the first group gave up quite soon. The second group a little later. The third group never gave up. They'd peck themselves to death rather than quit. Who knew what worked? I wish I had a pig ball. I laid, lie down on the braided rug. You can always practice, said Aunt Lydia. Several sessions a day fitted into your daily routine. Arms at the sides. Knees bent, lift the pelvis, roll the backbone down, tuck again. Breathe in to the count of five, hold, expel. We do that in what used to be the domestic science room, cleared now of sewing machines and washer dryers. In unison, lying on little Japanese mats, a tape playing. Les civildes. That's what I hear now in my head as I lift, tilt, breathe. Behind my closed eyes, thin white dancers split gracefully behind, among the trees, their legs fluttering like the wings of held birds. In the afternoons, we lay on our beds for an hour in the gymnasium between three and four. They said it was a period of rest and meditation. I thought then they did it because they wanted some time off themselves from teaching us. And I know the ants, not on duty, went off to the teacher's room for a cup of coffee or whatever they called by that, whatever they called by that name. But now I think that the rest also was practice. They were giving us a chance to get used to blank time. A catnap, Aunt Lydia called it in her coy way. As the strange thing is we needed the rest. Many of us went to sleep. We were tired there a lot of the time. We were on some kind of pill or drug, I think, they put in the food to keep us calm. But maybe not. Maybe it was the place itself. After the first shock, after you come to terms, it was better to be lethargic. You could tell yourself you were saving up your strength. I must have been there three weeks when Maura came. She was brought into the gymnasium by two of the ants in the usual way while we were having our nap. She still had her other clothes on, jeans and a blue sweatshirt. Her hair was short. She defied fashion as usual. So I recognized her at once. She saw me too, but she turned away. She already knew what was safe. There was a bruise on her left cheek turning purple. The ants took her to a vacant bed where the red dress was already laid out. She undressed, began to dress again. In silence, the ants standing at the end of the bed, the rest of us watching from inside our slitted eyes. As she bent over, I could see the knobs on her spine. I couldn't talk to her for several days. We looked only small glances like sips. Friendships were suspicious. We knew it. We avoided each other during the mealtime lineups in the cafeteria and in the halls between classes. But on the fourth day, she was beside me during the walk, two by two around the football field. We weren't given the white wings until we graduated. We had only the veils so we could talk as long as we did it quietly and didn't turn to look at one another. The ants walked at the head of the line and the end. So the only danger was from the others. Some were believers and might report us. This is a loony bin, Maura said. I'm glad, so glad to see you, I said. Where can we talk, said Maura. Washroom, I said. Watch the clock and stall, 2.30. That was all we said. It makes me feel safer that Maura is here. We can go to the washroom if we put our hands up, though there's a limit to how many times a day they mark it down on a chart. I watched the clock, electric and round, in, at the front of the green blackboard. 2.30 comes testify, during testifying. Aunt Helena is here, as well as Aunt Lydia, because testifying is special. Aunt Helena is fat. She once headed a Weight Watchers franchise operation in Iowa. She's good at testifying. It's Janine telling about how she was gang-raped at 14 and had an abortion. 
They told, she told the same story last week. She seemed almost proud of it while she was telling. It may not even be true. At testifying, it's safer to make things up than to say you have nothing to reveal. But since it's Janine, it's probably more or less true. But whose fault was it? Aunt Helena says, holding up one plump finger. Her fault, her fault, her fault, we chant in unison. Who led them on? Aunt Ellen, Helena beams, pleased with us. She did, she did, she did. Why did God allow such a terrible thing to happen? Teach her a lesson, teach her a lesson, teach her a lesson. Last week, Janine burst into tears. Aunt Helena made her kneel at the front of the classroom, hands behind her back, where we could all see her, her red face and dripping nose. Her ha hair dull blonde, her eyelashes so light they seemed not there. The lost eyelashes of someone who's been in a fire. Burned eyes. She looked disgusting. Weak, squirmy, blotchy, pink like a newborn mouse. None of us wanted to look like that, ever. For a moment, even though we knew what was being done to her, we despised her. Cry baby, cry baby, cry baby. We meant it, which was is the bad part. I used to think well of myself. I didn't then. That was last week. This week, Janine doesn't wait for us to jeer at her. It was my fault, she says. It was my own fault. I led them on. I deserved the pain. Very good, Janine, says Aunt Lydia. You are an example. I have to wait until this is over before I put up my hand. Sometimes, if you ask at the wrong moment, they say no. If you really have to go, that can be crucial. Yesterday, Dolores wet the floor. Two ants hauled her away, a hand under each armpit. She wasn't there for the afternoon walk, but at night she was back in her usual bed. All night we could hear her moaning, off and on. What did they do to her? We whispered from bed to bed. I don't know. Not knowing makes it worse. I raise my hand. Aunt Lydia nods. I stand up and walk out of, into the hall, as inconspicuously as possible. Outside the washroom, Aunt Elizabeth is standing guard. She nods, signaling that I can go in. This washroom used to be for boys. The mirrors on, have been replaced here, too, by oblongs of gray, dull gray metal. But the urinals are still there, on one wall, white enamel with yellow stains. They look oddly like babies' coffins. I marvel again at the nakedness of men's lives. The showers right out in the open, the body exposed for ex inspection and comparison, the public display of, display of privates. What is it for? What purposes of reassurance does it serve? The flashing of a badge, look, everyone all is in order, I belong here. Why don't women have to prove to one another that they are women? Some form of unbuttoning, some split crotch routine, just as casual, a dog-like sniffing. The old high school, the high school is old. The stalls are wooden, some kind of chipboard. I go into the second one from the end, swing the door to. Of course, there are no longer any locks. In the wood, there's a small hole at the back, next to the wall, about waist height, souvenir of some previous vandalism or legacy of an ancient voyeur. Everyone in the center knows about this hole and the woodwork, everyone except the ants. I'm afraid I am too late, held up by Janine's testifying. Maybe Maura has already been here. Maybe she's had to go back. They don't give you much time. I look carefully down, a slant under the stall wall, and there are two red shoes. But how can I tell who it is? I put my mouth to the wooden hole. Maura, I whisper, is that you? She says, yes, I say. Relief goes through me. God, do I need a cigarette, says Maura. Me too, I say. I feel ridiculously happy. I sink down into my body as into a swamp, Fenland, where only I know the footing, treacherous ground in my own territory. I become the earth I set my ear against for rumors of the future. Each twinge, each murmur of slight pain, ripples of slough, sloughed off matter, swellings and diminishings of tissue, the droolings of the flesh, the, these are signs. These are things I need to know about. Each month I watch for blood, fearfully, for when it comes it means failure. I have failed once again to fulfill the expectations of others, which have become my own. I used to think of my body as an instrument of pleasure, or uh, a means of transportation, or an implement for the accomplishment of my will. I could use it to run, push buttons of one sort or another, make things happen. There were limits, but my body was nevertheless live, single, solid, one with me. Now the flesh arrange it, arranges itself differently. I am a cloud, congealed around a central object, the shape of a pear, which is hard and more real than I am, and glows red with its translucent wrapping. Inside it is a space, huge as the sky at night, and dark and curved like that, though black-red rather than black. Pinpoints of light swell, sparkle, burst and shrivel within it, countless as stars. Every month there is a moon, gigantic, round, heavy as an omen. It transits, pauses, continues on, and passes out of sight, and I see despair coming towards me like famine. To feel that empty again, again, I listen to my heart, wave upon wave, salty and red, continuing on and on, marking time. I am in our first apartment, in the bedroom. I am standing in front of the cupboard, which has folding doors made of wood. Around me I know it's empty. All the furniture is gone. The floors are bare, no carpets even. But despite this, the cupboard is full of clothes. 
I think they're my clothes, but they don't look like mine. I've never seen them. Maybe they're clothes belonging to Luke's, Luke's wife, whom I've also never seen. Only pictures and a voice on the phone late at night when she is calling us before the divorce. But no, they're my clothes, all right. I need a dress. I need something to wear. I pull out dresses, black, blue, purple jackets, skirts. None of them will do. None of them even fits. They're too big or too small. Luke is there behind me. I turn to see him. He won't look at me. He looks down at the floor where the cat is rubbing itself against his legs, mewing and mewing plaintively. She want, it wants food, but how can there be any food in the, with the apartment so empty? Luke, I say, he doesn't answer. Maybe he doesn't hear me. It occurs to me that he may not be alive. I'm running with her, holding her hand, pulling, dragging her through the bracken. She's only half awake because of the pill I gave her, so she wouldn't cry or say anything that would give us away. She doesn't know where she is. The ground is uneven. Rocks, dead branches, the smell of damp earth, old leaves. She can't run fast enough. By myself, I could run faster. I'm a good runner. Now she's crying. She's frightened. I want to carry her, but she would be too heavy. I have my hiking boots on, and I think when we reach the water, I'll have to kick them off. Will it be too cold? Will she be able to swim that far? What about the current? We weren't expecting this. Quiet, I say to her angrily. I think about drow her drowning, and this thought slows me. Then the shots come behind us, not loud, not like firecrackers, but sharp and crisp like a dry branch snapping. It sounds wrong. Nothing ever sounds the way you think it will, and I hear the voice. Down, is it a real voice or a voice inside my head or my own voice out loud? I pull her to the ground and roll on top of her to cover her, shield her. Quiet, I say. My face is wet, sweat, or tears. I feel calm and floating as if I'm no longer in my body. Close to my eyes, there's a leaf, red, turned early. I see every bright vein. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I ease off. I don't want to smother her. Instead, I curl myself around her, keeping my hand over her mouth. There's breath in the knocking of my heart, like pounding at the door of the house at night. Where you would, where you thought you would be safe. It's all right. I'm here, I say. I whisper, please be quiet, but how can she? She's too young. It's too late. We come apart. My arms are held, and the edges go dark, and nothing is left but a little window. A very little window, like the wrong end of a telescope. Like the window on a Christmas card, an old one, night and ice outside, and within a candle, a shining tree, a family. I can hear the bells, even sleigh bells, from the wet radio, old music, but through this window I can see, small but very clear, I can see her going away from me. Though the trees which are already turning, yellow, red and yellow, holding out her arms to me, being carried away. The bell awakens me, and then Cora knocking at my door. I sit up on the rug, wipe my wet face with my sleeve. Of all the dreams, this is the worst.